Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. It's a pleasure to welcome our speaker today, uh, Alexandra Savo. Alexandra studies 20th century European history and is particularly interested in the medical histories of Jewish and Roma communities. Her dissertation focuses on Hungarian, Jewish, and Romani men's and women's experiences of sterilization and castration in Nazi camps and how the mass experiments affected their reproductive and personal lives later. She was the recipient of the EHRI Crystal Fellowship in 2020 and one of the inaugural Strauss Fellowships at Cedar sinai Center of Medicine, Holocaust and Genocide Studies in 2022, and the Margie and Douglas Greenberg Research Fellowship at USC Center for Advanced Genocide Research in 2023. Thank you for being here today, Alexandra. Thank you so much. Um, and hello, everyone. Thank you for your interest in my dissertation research. It's a real honor to be here and talk about my topic as as now a former um, Strauss fellow, but um, I was there in LA actually um, until May. Um, before I start sharing my slide, I want to first thank Frank Strauss, who made it possible for me to be here and gain invaluable knowledge from the professional setting that Cedar sinai is. With the fellowship, I had the chance to interpret the primary research material that I had gathered from different archives in a more knowledgeable way through conversations with um, clinicians, so with, with you from the obstetrics and gynecology department, as well as with specialists from the urology department. Um, I also want to shout out and thank Sari Siegel, the director of the program and the entire primary faculty of the program in the history of medicine for helping me think further and improve the conceptualization of my work. And I will begin sharing my presentation now. Um, OK. So the topic of my research is the sterilization and castration experiences of the Hungarian Roma and of the Hungarian Jews in National Socialist camps in a long durée perspective, as I want to understand the fertility and reproductive journeys and personal stories of surviving victims. Since my research so far yielded the understanding that the sterilization and castration experiments cause not only severe traumatic psychological effects, but constitutes of a continuous struggle, um, both physiological as well, I call this specific atrocity a prolonged genocide in my work. So here's a, a quick roadmap of my presentation or my talk today. I'm going to um, expand a little bit on the term prolonged genocide, uh, which I will be using in my in my dissertation. I will give a brief historical introduction, so the types of historical resources that I use, and a short overview of the history from the eugenics movement to the mass sterilization experiments that happened in National Socialist camps, uh, not only concentration, but also transit camps and death camps. I will focus mainly in today's talk on Auschwitz and the Nazi. I will um, present some of the Nazi physicians that work there. And then I will show you what my contribution to the field is, which is trying to unfold the victim side of this history. Um, in order to achieve this, I received um, tremendous help and guidance from, from the OBGY 
uh, department at Cedar sinai I'm going to specifically list some of the ways that I was able to realize um, this help and, and how it guided my reading of my of my sources. And I will show this through some of the cases um, that I have here with me today through three victims, Ejibet Fleischmann, Toby Berkowitz and Serena Flaster. So the victim experiences show that the sterilization and castration experiments that were means of genocide, tools of genocide, extended the destructive effects on the victims from the immediate moment when the medical abuse happened beyond the end of the war and throughout the entire lifetime of, of those who survived the camps. Specifically, what I have found in my research is that the victims who survived the Holocaust but had been sterilized or castrated suffered from primary or secondary infertility, and which means they did not have their own chance um, to have or not have biological children. There are victims, however, who did succeed in having children later in life, mainly those who had been experimented on for sterilization purposes but not for castration. Yet the women had difficulties with their pregnancies. Um, there's a high number of miscarriages that, that some statistics can show. These were due to physiological and psychological effects that the victims carried with them their whole lives. I will explicitly detail some examples in my talk today as, as, the, as the clinicians helped me identify the questions that I should be asking in my research. I will also discuss the types of intergenerational transmissions there might be for those victims who did conceive and have their own biological children. Um, but but this all really depends on how many how many how much material I can gather from specifically from those who have second and third generation um, survivors. In my further research, I will try to identify other outcomes that substantiate how these medical abuses resulted in a prolonged genocide for the victims. I'd like to highlight here today that the conceptualization of my term prolonged genocide is a work in progress, yet the results I wish to see from this idea is that the boundaries of the concepts of genocide and that of survival can be and should be blurred. This might go against legal and political definitions, but it is an experience that the victims speak to, which so far has not been elevated into the discussion. And this is what I will present to, um, to you today in my talk, the substantial meaning of the term prolonged genocide from the victim perspective, a concept that I will be arguing in my dissertation and later in a book. While the physiological outcomes are somewhat easier to research for a historian through medical documentation that are in the archives, the psychological effects has to be examined through a different approach. I chose to do this with a temporal examination, so I study the responses to the experiments through testimonies that the survivors have given, and there are different periods that I can examine. On the left side, these are usually testimonies in the form of protocols that were given in the immediate years following liberation in mid-1945 for document documentation centers. Here, um, basically, language knowledge of, of other languages besides English is crucial. The second type of um, testimonies were given either to legal or medical experts in the years between the 1950s and 1970s, usually war crime trials. Here, um, what I'm showing an example is Dr. Alina Brevda. She was in Auschwitz, um, an imprisoned physician. And the third cluster is the so-called belated testimonies that are of interview form in Holocaust memory related projects, such as the USC Shoah Foundation's video archive. The clearest indication of chronic trauma is when looking at the victim's video testimonies of this latter category. I will show a specific case today where even at the age of 93, the nonverbal cues clearly point to this. 
Before that, let me give a quick historical overview. The precursor to the experiments in the camps was the eugenics movement from the end of the 19th century that had its impact all around the globe. This led the Nazi government in the year of taking power, so in 1933, to introduce the law for the protection of genetically diseased offspring, also known as the sterilization law, and the law against dangerous habitual criminals, also known as the castration law. You can see the cover of the printed statutes on the slide in the original German language. On the left is the sterilization law and on the right is the castration law. These laws basically provided a basis for the involuntary um, coerced sterilization of individuals who were believed to suffer from hereditary diseases, physical and psychological disorders, that you can all, I, I translated them from German, you can read the exact cases on the slide, which as you might imagine, eventually turned out to be quite arbitrary and subjective, some of these categories. The most common method of sterilization for women was tubal ligation and vasectomy for men, while for castration it was orchiectomy. As far as I know, mainly men were castrated under the law in Germany, but there had been ovarectomies performed in hospitals under other circumstances as well, and then these set of laws were protective um, of the hospitals. All of these procedures took considerable time and manpower. Women's surgical sterilization and especially post-surgery recuperation was too lengthy for Nazi political aims. So research for methods of mass sterilization had been on the rise since at least 1935, so two years after these laws um, passed. This led to mass sterilization experiments that Nazi officials ordered with the leadership of Heinrich Himmler. They were conducted in transit, concentration, and death camps between 1942 and 1945. There had been ongoing animal and some human experiments of different methods to achieve mass infertility. In my current research, I'm also trying to uncover to what extent plant-based medicinal sterilization agents were used on Roma inmates. Um, but today, I'm going to present my findings from the most well-researched location, the infamous Block 10 at Auschwitz. These are um, my own pictures that I took of the, of the Block Hospital. This was under the supervision of gynecologist Dr. Karl Klauberg. Other perpetrating German physicians working here were Dr. Horst Schumann and Dr. Edward Wirtz, and other prisoner physicians who were inmates selected to assist or sometimes to fully carry out the experiments and or surgeries. I don't have time to go into the topic of prisoner physicians today, but I would like to note that their presence is extremely important in my research, since those who survived are invaluable for us to understand what happened during the experiments, as Germans didn't really leave a trace of, of what they were doing, for which unsurprisingly, the prisoner physicians were the ones who served as witness experts on war crime trials against the Nazi doctors after the war. That being said, they are considered controversial and in Holocaust scholarship, their presence and discussion is related to the notion of the so-called gray zone as not clearly being victims nor perpetrators. I brought an interactive walkthrough of block 10 so you can see what it um, looked like inside. And this is also important for us to have some context um, as to how precisely the victims talk about the, the space where they were forcibly um, experimented on. Based on prisoner physician, Dr. Alina Brev does recollections in her biography. On the ground floor, as one entered to the left were toilets and to the right was a washroom. Beyond the toilets on the left were Klauberg's four experimental rooms, one of which was a dark room for developing X-ray films, and, the ne and next to it was the room for the two SS women guards. 
At the back were some of the hospital wards, a dormitory for the nursing staff and a lab and for laboratory workers. On the right were further laboratories, a small operating theater and a small room for the block elder and the secretary of the block. On the upper floor where we are right now in this video, there were two large wards for 400 women prisoners from whom the selections were made for the various experiments. Some of these women had been transferred to Block 10 on its completion in March 1943. Others of various nationalities were brought in later. Um, <clears throat> the perpetrating Nazi physicians working here uh, were, as I mentioned, um, the, the most infamous one, Dr. Klauberg, who experimented on women to achieve fast and secretive infertility. And secretive, I mean, even for those women who were experimented on with the method of intrauterine injections, which were followed up by X-ray imaging to, to check if the women's uterine tubes were indeed closed up. What the injections actually contained is unclear today, but historian Ruth Yolanda Weinberger has gathered information from victim testimonies, mainly from prisoner physicians, prisoner nurses, survivors, and other secondary sources that suggest that there either could have been formalin included as part of a newly developed sterilization agent or other substances that contained iopodin, iodine, and silver nitrate, or derivatives of sex steroids and or cetobarium. Dr. Horst Schumann um, on the right here was the physician responsible for experimenting on men and women with the excessive use of electromagnetic radiation to destroy the hormone producing glands. On the left, Dr. Edward Wirtz focused on the de detection of precancerous lesions. So he performed amputations on the cervix. The size of the excision is up for debate, uh, uh, even today among historians. But there is a very detailed analysis by Sari Siegel um, that you can read in her study on prisoner physician, Dr. Maximilian Samuel, who assisted um, a Jewish uh, physician from, from Germany, who assisted Nazi physician Dr. Wirtz. My work and contribution to the field is understanding the victim side of the experiments. However, Sabina Hildebrandt, MD and lecturer at Harvard Medical School, who is part of my dissertation committee, writes that the absence of data on the women's experience may be symptomatic for a larger problem at the heart of studies on human beings in general and at the heart of gynecological studies in particular. My research as a Strauss Fellow at Cedar sinai had this aim to connect with your department and guide my reading of the victims' expressions of their experiences, not only about the experiments conducted forcibly on them, the, the momentary what happened to them question, but about their reproductive health and lives afterwards. Meetings with um, obstetricians and gynecologists help me understand the basic questions I have to ask when approaching my sources. I would like to highlight that the following presentation or, or the way I'm interpreting my, my sources and this, this interdisciplinary work I have focused on during my fellowship is by no means in an attempt to establish diagnoses for victims retrospectively. The conversations were instructional in sensitizing me to the physical manifestations of certain kinds of trauma that I otherwise wouldn't have been attuned to. This means that I will use the vocabulary of the diagnoses in the language they are as they are used today, including psychological diagnostic terms, but my goal is not to actually diagnose the people, but listen to and have awareness and a better understanding of what sort of nonverbal cues I'm examining. All of the conversations made me understand the importance of looking into the medical histories of the survivors already before the forced sterilizations or castrations took place. I am now also encouraged to look into generational effects 
if they can be traced. For example, in some instances where the daughters suffer from menstrual irregularities. These are aspects and questions I can mainly ask when conducting my own interviews with survivors who were able to have children later and are still alive or with the second and third generation. Unfortunately, these this kind of information is is not accessible through the previous types of source material that I showed on a previous um, slide. This aspect, if I would find um, cases, would no doubt corroborate my thesis of what I call a prolonged genocide, whereas it could add to our understanding of the intergenerational transmission um, of trauma from a more physiological approach as well. Um, Dr. Wang explained to me the differences between primary and secondary amenorrhea and whether the women, after having been experimented on, suffered from temporary or permanent amenorrhea. Dr. Wang noted the additional physiological outcomes of permanent amenorrhea next to infertility, such as detrimental cardiovascular health or detrimental bone health that leads to osteoporosis. This guidance allowed me to read Elizabeth Fleischmann's hospital discharge report in a new light. That one you can see it's the image on the right side. It's mainly written in Hungarian. Um, the yellow markers are my notes. Apologies for leaving those in. So according to this assessment, in 1957 she was suffering from hypertension, arteriosclerosis, bronchonomia, and diabetes mellitus. All the lab test results that are present on the report confirm that she was suffering from what is called today metabolic syndrome. The note on the left side of the slide is stamped by the main OBGYN hospital in Budapest of the time of the 50s and 60s. It says amputatio uteri supravaginale, which means that besides the intrauterine injections she remembered getting from Dr. Klauberg, which she in a different document writes down when she's asking for compensate, when she's filing a compensation claim to Germany. This shows that she possibly also had the colposcopy experiment performed on her by Dr. Wirtz in block 10, which resulted in the amputation of the cervix. In order to receive more information about Ejibet um, and specifically her, her gynecological uh, assessment, I need to go back to the city archives of Budapest and ask for the hospital's registry books of 1957 or 1958 to understand how they assessed her condition and what exactly the kind of gynecologists wrote down about her cervix and what medical advice she received about her fertility. Although Ajibat was already 58 years old, as we can see it um, here, in 1957, it is quite unlikely that she wanted to have children. Nevertheless, the majority of the survivors only had children at a more advanced age. Dr. Tanya Esikov helped me understand pregnancy and its physiology in advanced maternal age, which most of those survivors who miscarried constantly after the Holocaust reflect on in their video testimonies. Toby, for example, after having survived the Holocaust, got married to her husband in 1950, after which she had a miscarriage when she was seven months pregnant. The child would have been their firstborn. When seeking medical attention in the local hospital, she was told by the doctor that she would have to start trying to conceive immediately and not spend too much time grieving. Another seven months after the loss of her first pregnancy, Toby gave birth to her son, who weighed five pounds. Similarly, her second child was born prematurely at six months and was kept in an incubator for seven weeks. At this time, Toby was already 40 years old. Next to all the um, physiological risks that Dr. Ezekov told me about, another important risk for advanced age pregnancy is postpartum depression, although PTSD is most probably already a given for those who survived Nazi persecution, as Einav Accord suggests. 
Dr. Court's expert knowledge in perinatal mental health helped me understand the different ways that survivors discuss their memories relating to the experiments, as well as their inability to have children later in life. She highlighted that the differences in talking and sharing might also go back to the question of control and blame. We went through the symptoms of PTSD, anxiety disorder, and depression so I could better understand how the victims remember their sterilization or castration experiences in video testimonies and what effects the memories still have on them at an older age. Serena Flaster's video is an example of what I showed to Dr. Court and how our discussion made me understand that the nonverbal cues I'm seeing could be the result of psychological effects that the memories of the sterilization experiments have on the victims even 55 years after the medical atrocity took place. I'm going to show you um, a short excerpt now of this video. From what we have read, there were other experiments going on at Auschwitz. Did yeah. you know about any of them? Did you hear rumors about any of the other experiments that were being done in Auschwitz? A lot. Did you hear about it then while you were there? You heard, yeah. what did you hear was going on? Aside from the, the boys across the way. Yeah. What else were you hearing about? I don't remember. Okay. So you were there for 20 months. 20 months. And then they came, it came the evacuation, you know. Bef and during the 20 months, though, were you examined? Did they examine you internally? Did they do any tests? Yeah. Yeah. While you were in block 10, yes. Did they examine Nobody you? Did. They just gave these shots. Did they make notes or ask you questions? Mrs. Flaster, did they ask you any questions? Questions? Did they ask you questions? What kind of questions? Did they ask you how you were feeling if you noticed any changes? If this was an experiment, they didn't ask that. They, did. yeah, they, were, okay. they were not interested okay. in that. So here we could see that Serena, although very alert throughout the other sections of the interview, falls basically asleep in the middle of the questions. While there seems to be a tangible frustration between the interviewee and the interviewer throughout the interview, here she seems to be dissociating with the sleep. This is a very strong reaction to the questions, not very common among other interviews, and shows that she is not able to pull out the memories of Block 10, where she had been confined for 20 months at the age of 38 and experimented on with intrauterine injections. The entire interview lasts a bit more than three hours, and she does not describe what had happened to her, she gives some information about the setting and the names she heard there before the, before this um, excerpt of the video, but she cannot recount the events. I find it very important to be able to analyze such visual elements of testimonies because they are absolutely a marker of the experience that sterilization abuse meant in the camps together with the silences that this memory creates. Again, I'm not using the knowledge of what dissociation means as a symptom of PTSD as a tool of diagnosis in my historical work. I'm instead furthering my understanding of what might be happening to the survivor 55 years after the events took place. This substantiates my stance on the prolonged nature of sterilization and castration as means and tools of genocide by showing the nature of the memory that it carries. Finally, 
talking with Dr. Katrina Heyrana made me rethink the complexities that survivors later in their reproductive journeys had to consider. Dr. Heyrana's research on how medical decisions are made, her work on highlighting the changing mentalities about abortion and contraception in Filipino ex communities and how it affects women's and families' decisions is also an important methodology that can guide my approach to Jewish and Roma families who have very different backgrounds um, and cultural, cultural backgrounds. We discussed the complexities of women being child-free by decision, an important aspect I need to implement when thinking about those who were forcibly sterilized, who became infertile, infertile later in life, and how this affected the societies they lived in. Dr. Hayrana explained to me what sterilization procedures look like today, which discussion made me understand how both the Nazi past and the eugenic past, especially here in the US, shed their light on our understanding of sterilization today and our own choices of sterilization. And even if this is to a certain extent implicit, it has its impacts both for medical professionals and people planning their family lives. And I would like to thank everyone who helped me prepare for this um, talk, as well as for the, the, the chapter that will be in my, in my dissertation and following the book. Oh, and I saw that I finished earlier, but I guess that's OK. Um, did I stop sharing the PPT? Uh, yes. OK. OK, and um, I didn't plan it to be much longer because I was hoping that um, there would be questions. I understand that this is a different type of um, talk that I gave today um, from a historical perspective. Thank you so much, Alexandra, for this uh, really important talk. Do we have any questions for Alexandra? Well, I just want to say that I think, you know, I know you spoke with a number of people in our department and I was one of them also, and um, I certainly learned a lot from our discussion and this uh, very um, important topic. Um, and I think what we can do is if anyone has questions, I know Priscilla also has your contact information so that um, uh, moving forward, we can also email you with any questions. Absolutely. Thank you. We really appreciate your talk today. Thank you, Dr. Wang. Thank you for your work. Very important. Thank, Thank, you. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, okay, bye-bye.